Yes, guys, how you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I'm Sean Butler. I hope you are all happy and healthy doing the things you love with those that you love doing them with. It's Monday. Happy Monday, if there is such a thing. But the Euros is only a week away, not even a week away. So we're looking forward to hopefully some good football to be witnessed over the coming month or so. We've got some Tottenham transfer news, views and clues for you today, guys. I usually be outside with Bugsy Malone. In fact, I was out with her for an hour, but she wouldn't stop barking. And so I couldn't get the video done without making it unbearable for you. So I'm going to bring it back to the old school, do it in front of my desk and see how we go. Guys, uh, before we get into it, can you do me some favors? If you don't mind, can you hit the like button for me like you always do on the video? In fact, I have to say a massive thank you to those people that participated on Saturday. The last video I updated, uh, uploaded was the uh, the record amount of likes on any video I've done before for this channel. 2,600 likes, I think, came in. So um, unbelievable stuff. Thank you so much to everybody. I only ever ask because Apparently, it helps the algorithm find new people that might enjoy the content. And that's exactly what happened. A lot of new subscribers as well. So welcome to them. I hope you enjoy your stay. And let's get into it, guys. Hit the notification bell as well. But drop a comment. And I do need your help on this one because, you know you know me, I'm liable to take a little bit of information that might be insignificant and then make a mountain out of a molehill in the hypothesis of what it might mean, the connotations and consequences. And we have something to chew over today. And that's from Fabrizio Romano. Last time he spoke about Tottenham, he said he expected Tottenham after the, the Timo Werner signing to sign at least one more forward. And half the fan base kind of lost their mind thinking that meant one more forward. And the other half said, hang on, that, that could mean anything. One, it could mean two, it could mean seven. Don't worry, nothing to see here. But over the weekend, he came out and said, alongside the noise that he thinks that Brian Hill is going to leave the club. And there's more reports on that today, which I'll come to in a second. Um, he said that he thinks the plan is for Tottenham to sign one more forward. So he clarified it's a specific solo number, which to me, if true, and again, this is where we speculate, you know, how much does he really know? Is he just throwing out these things? I don't know. He's an ITK. Broadly speaking, he's more accurate than most. He, if anyone's a tap-in merchant when it comes to ITK stuff, it's him. But you know, let's just treat it with the respect that, you know, his name, I guess, deserves in terms of credibility. But certainly it's it's pretty worrying to me if that is in fact the answer. I said before, I'm only okay with uh, with Timo Werner if he's part of a bigger picture plan within the forward line plans for the summer. And that requires me to see a top winger coming in and a striker that's better than Rashalas and better first touch that can more of a poacher that can, can do a bit more. If it's only going to be one forward coming in now, if it's true that's the case, then... That really does concern me because it either means we're going to go big in one position but leave ourselves with weaknesses in the other, or you know it means we're going to get a versatile player that can do a little bit of everything. And there's only a couple of names out there in the forward line space that I personally fancy at Tottenham who can play as wingers and out and out number nines and like a lowest opender maybe. But are RB Leipzig really going to? Um, let him go for the on the cheap. Does he even want to leave? I don't know, and I, I doubt it. Apart from that, the other names that we're linked with, you know, are kind of all sp specific forwards in a in a certain role. Someone like an Ivan Tony certainly can't play on the wing. Someone like a Jimenez can't play on the wing. You know, are you happy if the forward options on the wing for next season are Solomon, um, Kulusevski? Um, Timo Werner and and Brennan Johnson. I'm not. I, I I needed to see someone else. So I really hope it's not true. I really do hope it's not true. Um, there are there is other news. We're gonna, we're gonna come back to the Romano stuff because you you've also got an, an exclusive from Football Insider today, guys, saying that Tottenham are working with Paratici on four deals currently. Um, Eze Gallagher, uh, Tony, and one other, I believe. Obviously, it's not really an exclusive. All those names are. Um, are already out there, but we know that I, that uh, Football Insider are pretty liberal with the use of the word exclusive. Let's go through some of the other new, the other noise though, because I do want to kind of wrap and hopefully wrap this round into a big cyclical uh, video for you. Um, first and foremost, there's the noise about Tangy and Dombele. I didn't do a video yesterday. He is set to leave the club. But Tottenham is set to shake hands on some sort of termination for his final year, similar to what we've done with Aurier and with Matt Doherty in the past. Um, look, I think that the only way that it makes sense is if there's either going to be some sort of uh, compromise on the overall valuation. It's clearly the biggest mistake in Tottenham's transfer history of £200 million, give or take. £60 million 
give or take on the, um, sorry, not 200 million pound, 120 million pounds, sorry, 60 million pound on the transfer and 60 million pound, uh, 10 million pound a year in wages. And, you know, we probably maybe could have looked to have loaned him out for his final year again, but his effort and his energy and his levels have been so lackluster whilst on loan, just like they have been at Tottenham, that it would be difficult to be able to find another club to pay anything like anything more than maybe 10% of his salary. And so then there's an opportunity cost, right? Because you can only loan seven players per season to overseas clubs uh, anyway. And so he's taking up a spot every year and maybe Tottenham have ambitions this year to loan out more of the younger players overseas to find better fits for them. I'm not sure what the intentions are, but it might just be as simple as that his efforts have in the past proven that no one's willing to pay anything like you know, a decent enough amount of money to take up one of those seven spots. And consequently, if there is wiggle room and, and maneuverability in the, on the part of the player and the agent to come to a compromise, then maybe that's what's in the best interest of all clubs. Now, in terms of what that looks like, look, he doesn't have to shake hands on any kind of dilution of his salary. He can expect the full 10 million. He might agree to a 50%, like we'll give you 5 million up front. Now, that's nice that you save 5 million, but it also means that you're paying... Uh, 5 million out of your cash flow up top. Similar to what you have to do if you're triggering a release fee. There's no obligation necessarily for the players, uh, the, the selling club who are being forced to sell to liquidate in a way that's amenable for the buying club, i.e. structuring the payments in a, in a kind of nice way. They can demand it up front as long as there's no stipulations in the contract. Um, and that obviously Im impacts your cash flow. With regards to Ndombele, it might be that we come to a, a meeting in the middle and say, look, you've robbed us of £50 million already. Can we finish it at 55 rather than 60 Or it might mean, and I'm not sure on the rules on this, it could mean that Tottenham could shake hands and say, we'd rather pay you the full £10 million, but can we stretch it over three or four years and make that a 50 grand a week commitment rather than 200 grand a week? I don't know if that's plausible, but if it is, then that might be something that's beneficial for Tottenham in terms of cash flow, in terms of amortization, in terms of FFP. Not that we're close to the FFP line, but I'm just putting it out there. That's the scenario. Anyway, so Tangy looks like he's going to be off and set to leave. And we can put this kind of era, the Tangy and Nombele era behind us and hopefully won't make similar mistakes in the future. Another player that you probably could say has been a mistake in the past, though, was Lo Celso. As much as I like him as a player, and I really do, when he's fit, he's a wonderful player. He hasn't been fit enough for Tottenham. And he's coming into the last year of his contract. And it looks like Real Betis is the only team that are really sniffing around in Spain that might be able to pay the money that we're looking for for him. And consequently, this morning, there is noise that Aston Villa are interested in taking Lo Celso to Villa Park under Unai Emery, where I think he played for under uh, at least one of the two years at Villa Real. Um, now, look, I'm always someone who gets into kind of conversations in the comment section because I say to people, Tottenham need to worry about themselves. Do what's in the best interest of Tottenham and not worry so much about other clubs. But then I get reminded of that when I talk about signing players like Conor Gallagher and putting out the option of, well, you know, is it, good, is it in the best interest of Tottenham to be helping Chelsea a direct rival out with their FFP situation? And I think that you can consider that as part of the, the conversation without worrying about other clubs so to speak. And I would argue the same thing for Lo Celso. Look, Villa are a, top, a Tottenham rival. They've done very well over the last two or three years. They spent a lot of money and it's worked out. They qualified for the Champions League and under Unai Emery, they're a very good team. Lo Celso would be a very good fit. Now, he hasn't naturally been happy in England, but under Unai Emery, he probably would be. And maybe Villa, look, the, the problem with Villa is that whilst their efforts haven't gone unrewarded, the fruits of their labour haven't started paying uh, the Champions League revenue yet that they haven't got that money in and the FFP consequences of putting that money up front and going for it over the last two or three years has arrived. They have to pay the piper before the Champions League money comes in. And so one of the stories that's out there is that Villa need to sell before they can buy to make sure they stay clear of any problems with FFP on PSR. And that might look like selling one of their kind of more att attacking midfielders that has a 35, 40 million pound valuation and then bringing in Lo Celso, who would be a good fit, isn't that much of a value gap as a player, but in terms of the financial difference can get them through that particular issue. Now, apparently Lo Celso would be more than happy to move to Villa. We saw Clement Longley go from Tottenham to Villa on loan, slightly different situation, but you know there is 
a bit of history there around players being willing to leave and go to Villa and do well and, and have a good time. So I wouldn't put it past Lo Celso to want to do this. I'd like to ask you, would you be happy if you saw Lo Celso moving to Villa to help them out, to give them a good player? He would do well there. Helping out your competition if it meant that Tottenham can get four or five million pounds more than you would likely get from a Spanish club where at least he's out of the way and he's not going to come back to bite you. I'm not sure. And when you think about the Romano noise and you think about the, the, the transfer budgets that we probably have and what you're going to get from other areas, which we'll talk about in a second, you know, I could make the argument that four or five million pounds might actually be quite important when you look around what else is likely to come in. We'll get to that. Before we ca uh, carry on, guys, um, let's just finish up the, the rest of the outgoing news. Alejo Valiz is looking likely to go back out on loan this year. We're not sure where yet. Hopefully, it'll be an internal, like an English um, system loan, maybe to the championship so he can learn England, uh, learn English. <laughs> learn England. Wow. Um, learn English and, and obviously learn the English system as well and, you know, sort of get settled in England. I, I don't see the point in loaning him out to a team that doesn't play him in a, in a place where he's already comfortable. You need to kind of, I don't know, get him get him on the process of of, of settling into the environment even if that means a championship team. I think it's more more, more more beneficial. So hopefully we'll make that move happen. Joe Roden, he's someone that obviously we're looking at and hoping that we can get money for. Now, uh, John Wenham, Lily White Rose, the guy who knows a lot about the youth team at Tottenham, he said that Leeds' uh, move for Roden is still on, um, but they have losses of over £100 million pound that they have to kind of figure out. And so it might delay the process. And them not getting into the Premier League via the playoffs is probably going to hurt them, but hopefully it won't hurt the trade for Roden. And Roden would still be okay going to Leeds. He likes it there that much. He'd do another season in the Championship. But what it's worth, Jose Mourinho, who is the new manager at Fenerbahce, has apparently intimated that he was a fan of Joe Roden and wouldn't be uh, um, wouldn't be shy of the idea of bringing him to Turkey, which is a strange one. Uh, I can't see that one really happening, but it's in the news, so I thought I'd bring it to you. Uh, Andreas Pereira, guys, uh, we spoke about him last week. Uh, Fulham's sort of number 10. He's been asked, he, he was asked by a journalist what he thought about his, the links to Tottenham and to other places and his future at Fulham. And he said he would sit down with his agent uh, in a couple of weeks and figure out what options he has and what's in the best interests of him. But what it's worth, whilst I said it last week, I do like the player. I don't think it's a massive fit. I think him as a player requires a lot of kind of specialists in the support behind him to protect him and allow him to be free to do what he does. Even doing that for what it's worth, I looked at his actual output numbers and they weren't particularly spect spectacular this year. 44 games for Fulham, three goals and nine assists. What's that? One, one GA every three and a half games. Not good enough for me and not really a player that would excite me uh, enough to, uh, to wet my beak, especially when we've got the homegrown issue and if we are going to pay decent money for a player that can come into the kind of 10 role and participate and compete with with uh, Madison, then um, you know you might as well sp spend it on a player that's also going to tick a few other boxes as well. We're going to come to those two in a minute when we talk about the, the Romano noise. Uh, Emerson Royale, quickly, guys, uh, that story about him to Milan, it's still very much on. 20 million uh, euros is the suggested agreeable fee at the moment. Milan are about 17, and I think Tottenham want 25, but apparently everything's kind of getting towards the solution. And what makes that noise even, that story even nicer for me is when I spoke to you last week about the potential replacement in Vanderson, I thought I was under the impression that his valuation was about 30 million euros. But apparently, according to a few reports that I've seen today, they only expect about 20 million for him, 17 million pounds. And so you might even see a situation where Emerson Royale can leave the club, Vanderson can come in, be his replacement, and essentially not much money move hands either way, which would be a really good deal because for me, Vanderson is probably not quite as good at defensive work right in a right-back role as Emerson Royale is, but in terms of on the ball, he fits the system much better. He's uh, far more comfortable in terms of running with the ball, and therefore, you know, for me, the overall net benefits in terms of... Um, the on the ball stuff is uh, far outweighs. And so the only question then is whether Vanderson is going to acclimate to the Premier League. Um, and I think he will. Oh, you, you hope he will. But he's a good player and I wouldn't mind seeing that. So if Royale can be replaced with Vanderson, by Vanderson for a net zero kind of outlay, then I think that makes good sense. Jack Chapman, last story for you guys. The South, the ex-Southampton 
head of recruitment of the academy, has joined Tottenham. I don't know much about this guy. I'll be honest. I don't know if he signed any people that have become worldies. Um, I think he also had some history before Southampton in a Welsh club, and I don't want to get it wrong, but I think it's one of Cardiff or Swansea. I'm not going to speculate because I'll offend someone. So, <laughs> But yeah, good luck to him coming in, and let's see what uh, that looks like. I don't know if that's disrupt disruption to the, to the academy. I, I've got no idea uh, really uh, what sort of um, impact that's going to have, but let's just hope he does well and brings in a few uh, a few players that will eventually become part of the first team. Guys, look, let's start. Let's let's sort of focus on Romano's thing for a second. I, I know I might, might be guilty of making a mountain out of a molehill here, but he actually has said specifically he expects one more forward to come in, and that to me is is really scary. If he's talking from a place of truth and knowledge, and that uh, when you bake in the sort of the other stories that are out there. So Ivan Tony is the most advanced striker, right? If that's if that's who he's talking about, forty million pounds. And I'm I'm still on board with the player. By the way, I do like him, but that means that our wingers for next season are Kulusevski, Johnson, um, Solomon, and Timo Werner. Like, listen, and that, that's they, if they can all stay fit, and they haven't been able to. Solomon hasn't been able to. That's a guarantee he won't stay fit. That's a massive problem for me. If it means that we're not going to get a striker and we're going to go and get a winger then and we'll play someone else through the middle like a Johnson is a nine or a Timo occasionally is a nine or a Sonny is a nine to compete with Richarlison then that is problematic because again those guys don't suit the natural the way that we see ourselves set up against the template that has emerged to play against us so it's problematic when you go through the link the, the list of uh, forwards that we've been linked with most of them are specific to one type of role as a forward Solanke is a nine he, he, I don't think you could ask him to play as a wide take on specialist. Dusan Vlaevic, definitely a nine. Albert Goodmanson probably is a variety player, a versatile player, but he's already committed to Genoa as far as I'm aware. Nico Williams is a winger. Neto's a winger. Noosa's a winger. Sesco, uh, a nine more than anything else. Probably can play a little bit of a winger, but he's got better, bigger fish to fry than Tottenham, I would imagine, this summer. Ivan Tony, as I say, is a nine. Garassi is a nine. I don't think that we'd sign him anyway, but... Uh, He's on the list, I guess. Josh Xerxes, another player that, you know, I, I don't see the value in. A lot of people do. But he is probably going elsewhere to Milan. And then you've got Santiago Jimenez, who's another very often linked name, who's, uh, who's a nine, not a winger. The only name that we've been linked with recently, and it wasn't even a serious link, it was John Wenham's, the same name. He was the guy who said this would be his favourite player we could sign. That's why we spoke about it, was Lois Openda from Leipzig. And as I said, I don't think that they're going to sell him anyway. And if they did, there'd be a long list of suitors. So to me, the idea of only signing one forward is worrying. It's even more worrying if, when Romano says that, he's actually meaning Eberechi Eze, who you could interpret as a forward if you're considering him at Tottenham to play more on the left wing, which I don't think is a great fit. As much as I love the player, and I do, I really, really do love the player, I don't think he's a great fit for the left wing spot. I don't think he's a take on specialist. I feel like you're spending a lot of money, 70 million, 68 million pound on a player. And I don't know the structure of the deal, whether they're, it would be required, as, as I said earlier, similar to like, you know, terminating contracts, you have to negotiate on the terms and there's not any ne necessity unless it's baked into the terms of the, of the deal that crystal palace would, would be mean, um, amenable to, uh, consider the needs of Tottenham when it comes to selling their player that they probably don't want to sell if, unless they unless they have to. There's also the kind of conversation around Conor Gallagher, right? This is the, 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 the football insider story here is saying that Tottenham are closing four deals, Tony, Gallagher, Eze. The value proposition of Conor Gallagher is in no small part, part down to the fact that he is versatile, that he can play in the six, the eight or the 10. The value proposition of Eze is also that he is versatile, that he can play in the 10 or the, the winger spot. If Tottenham are really going to progress and move for both players, I think there's a problem because at £70 million and £40 million, just say for argument's sake, £50 million, that's £120 million. That is what I believe is the net budget anyway before you even get into players like Vanderson, players like a left-sided centre-back, players like a specific six. I don't think Gallagher is a specific six. I don't think we have a good enough six 
and listen over to Ange. If Ange does think that Basuma is is good enough as a six, or um, that uh, that that Benson Core would be eventually, then then maybe. But I genuinely don't. I've never thought so ever since uh, before Ange played his first game. So to me, I look at the budgets, look at the spend, look at the links, and think if you're going to get twenty million pound for Pierre Mohoibier, you're you're going to get twenty for Royale, but that's going to go on Vanderson. You're going to get 15 for Los Celso. You're going to get 10 for Hill, maybe 10 or 15 for, for Rodon. That's about 80 million pounds in, in money coming in for players going out. If you maximize the value and you get rid of all of the players that you want to go. Plus you have your 120 million pound net spend. And that's top end of the budgets, in my opinion. That gives you 200 million. You're already spending 20 on Vanderson. You're going to spend 70 on Eberechi Eze. So that's 90. If, if, if Gallagher's the other guy as well, and that is 50. I think you're you're killing a lot of birds, but you're throwing more stones to try and think of a better example. That, that analogy is rubbish. I think you're I think you're you're um you're spending too much of the budget. I'll just keep it literal. You're spending too much of the budget on too many players that that can do too many similar things. You've already got Madison and you've already got other players that can progress and play a little bit more forward. For me, SA is not going to be as good, I don't think, um, in a kind of double pivot eight. Gallagher for sure makes sense in that role, but then do you still need to keep hold of Bentoncourt and Skip and Basuma if you're going to do that? I'm not sure. For me, I think the most pressing role in this in the middle is in a specific six, and I don't think Gallagher is good enough at that or has proven to be good enough at that to justify that particular outlay. It's a worry for me, guys, when you hear that Polini is going to Bayern Munich and therefore Josh Kimmich is up for sale. He'll probably move to, to somewhere else. He wouldn't come to Tottenham. I'd be surprised. Um, but that might kick on a merry-go-round of sixes that are out there that are specialists. You know, there's Jao Gomez, there's um, Ezequiel Palacios, you've got Ugarte. I'd rather see us spend £50 million on that than, than on a Gallagher and an Eze. I'm a little bit concerned. As I say, it might, it might just all be a mountain out of a molehill. It might just be that Tottenham are only going to sign one of Eze or Gallagher, not both. But let me know your thoughts. You know, do you see the same concerns that I do? That when you The budget's what they are. You have to sell everyone to make to make sense. If Romano's right that it's only one forward, then you're either going to be left with a decent striker option like an Ivan Tony, but not enough support to bring the ball to him. There's a lot of kind of square pegs and round holes shenanigans that I can see kind of um, happening here. And I really hope that Romano's wrong. As I say, it's just left a bit of a weird taste in my mouth to think that we're only going to bring in one more forward when, for me, the only things we need this summer are a winger, a striker, a six and and then obviously a, a replacement for Royale and a left-sided centre-back. And I think that 200 million quid net spend, getting rid of those players is more than enough to go and do some really good, really good business for those four or five positions. But if you're going to drop a lot of it on two players whose value proposition overlaps each other, in the case of Gallagher and Eze, then I don't think you need to be keeping all of the other midfielders that you have and there's no noise that we're going to be selling for Suma, and there's no noise we're going to be selling Bentoncourt. And Hoybier, I haven't seen any links for him for a few weeks. That's gone cold. We hope that it's Atletico Madrid. Juve have got a new manager, and you know they, they don't necessarily want Hoybier as much as the last guy did. So um, I don't know. I'm sorry if this is a little bit of a moody update, guys, but I just feel like the noise is a little bit kind of... Uh, um, like there's a, not not too much out today to get excited about. Lo Celso to Villa is, is also one that kind of leaves me a little bit raw on the inside. I'd, I'd, I'd like him, but I don't want him to come back and bite us. And I feel like at Villa, he could. So I don't know. Let me know your thoughts, guys. Maybe I'm probably doing what I usually do, which is overanalyzing it. Maybe there's nothing to see here. But do you think that Tottenham will sign both Eze and Gallagher? And do you think that makes sense to spend that much money of our budget on players? You know, can you see Lo Celso? Can you see... Madison, Eze, Gallagher, all playing at the same time in a Tottenham team and being able to work together in fluid rigidity. Like Eze on the left, does that make as much sense to you as Eze through the middle? I'm not sure. But that's that's the numbers. That's the that's the uh, the noise. That is your today's Tottenham transfer news, views, and clues, guys. Uh, I will let you go, and I will see you on the next one. Uh, like, subscribe, and comment. And as always, bye bye.